I'm very glad to be here. My name is Gregory Wolf. I'm the editor of Image Journal, a journal of arts and literature as they encounter the religious traditions of Western civilization, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I'm very pleased to be here tonight to be factotum and interviewer in chief for Christian Wyman. Um, let me just give you some of the official language. If I can get my fingerprint to open my tablet here. Christian Wyman is the author, editor, and translator of nine books. His most recent book is my uh, prose book is My Bright Abyss, Meditations of a Modern Believer, which the New Republic called an apologia and a prayer, an invitation and a fellow traveler for any who suffer and all who believe. His most recent book of poems is Once in the West. His previous collection, Every Riven Thing won the Ambassador Award and was listed as one of the 10 best books of the year by The New Yorker. Of his work as a whole, Marilyn Robinson writes, his poetry and scholarship have a purifying urgency that is rare in this world. This puts him at the very source of theology and enables him to say things in timeless language so that the reader's surprise and assent are one and the same. From 2003 until 2013, he was the editor of Poetry Magazine, the premier magazine for poetry in the English-speaking world. During that time, the magazine's circulation tripled, and it garnered two National Magazine Awards from the American Society of Magazine Editors. Mr. Wyman has written for The New Yorker, the New York Times Book Review, the Atlantic Monthly, and numerous other publications. He is a former Guggenheim Fellow and holds an honorary doctorate of humane letters from North Central College. His particular interests, according to his website where he teaches at the Yale Divinity School, include modern poetry, the language of faith, accidental theology, that is theology conducted by unexpected means, my favorite kind, and what it means to be a Christian intellectual in a secular culture. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I have to start off by saying, Chris, that my wife just loves your book, My Bright Abyss. She says it perfectly describes our marriage. Oh, nice. <laughs> just the title? Yeah, oh, yeah. well... Maybe. <laughs> so we started off with a poem uh, called George Gray. It was just read so beautifully for us just now. And it, it ended with the line that gives us our theme for the New York encounter this year. Does it spark any thoughts in you? It does. Um, you know, I, I, as I was thinking about it, I, I, um, in my own life, I'm struck by how often I can articulate a psychological dilemma and being able to articulate it will not rescue me from it. Uh, I think that's a, we live in a therapeutic culture and we think if we, can, if, we can, if we can just put words on it, then we will be released from our tensions. But I often find that's not true. And I think what releases me are remembrances of moments when I was released. The great Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel says, faith is mostly faithfulness to the times when we had faith, which I think is a wonderful definition, very hopeful definition. If you find you go through life wondering about your faith and you think, well, at, at one time I must have had it. And, and you remain faithful to those moments in your lives when you had faith. Uh, Edgar Lee Masters is an American poet that he makes me think of this other poet, A.R. Ammons. Um, I don't have the poem in front of me, but I think I can do it. If I mess up, bear with me. Uh, it is sort of perfect for the, the theme of this, of this conference. The poem is called The City Limits. The late, great poet A.R. Ammons, he died about 13 years ago. When you consider the radiance that it does not withhold itself, but pours its abundance without selection into every nook or cranny not overhung or hidden. 
When you consider that birds' bones make no awful noise against the light, but lie low in the light as in a high testimony, when you consider the radiance, that it will look into the guiltiest swervings of the weaving heart and bear itself upon them, not flinching into disguise or darkening. When you consider the abundance of such resource as illuminates the glow blue bodies and gold skinned wings of flies swarming the dumped guts of the natural slaughter or the coil of shit and in no way winces from its storms of generosity when you consider that air or shale, snow, or vacuum, squid, or wolf, rose, or lichen, each is accepted into as much light as it will take. Then the heart moves roomier. The man stands and looks about. The leaf does not increase itself above the grass, and the dark work of the deepest cell is of a tune with may bushes and fear, lit by the breadth of such calmly turns to praise and fear lit by the breath of such calmly turns to praise that master's poem reminds me of the ammon's poem that ammon's poem is a moment of faith i think written by a person incidentally who professed not to have any faith back to you <laughs> <laughs> So, longing for the sea and yet afraid. There's a, this word longing, it's a word that you have used yourself, I think particularly in, in My Bright Abyss. You actually start the book with a kind of a short fragmentary poem or poem you call a failed poem that includes that word longing. Uh, some people might use the word desire interchangeably with longing. What is this longing? What, what is it in the human heart that, that seems driven by this desire? Yeah, I wrote this, little, I, I wrote this whole book uh, out of the inability to write a single poem. And the, the fragment of the poem goes, My God, my bright abyss, into which all my longing will not go. Once more I come to the edge of all I know, and believing nothing, believe in this. What? This. Uh, I couldn't finish it. The tough poem to finish. What do you believe in? Well, the, the poem wouldn't finish, and years passed. And finally, I began writing little prose fragments out of the inability, out of an this longing to say something, but an inability to know what it was that needed to be said. Um, I think the longing is God. I, mean, I, think, I think we long for uh, a completion uh, that we sense we lack. Uh, Marilyn Robinson, you mentioned, I, I'm deeply flattered and gratified by that comment she made because I love her work. And in my favorite book of hers, Housekeeping, she has this wonderful passage. It starts, imagine a Carthage sown with salt and all the sowers gone and the seeds laying however long in the earth till there arose in vegetable profusion a garden of leaves and trees of rime and brine. What flowering could there be in such a garden? And then she goes on to talk about how need can blossom into all the compensations it requires. For when do we know anything so utterly as when we lack it? And here again is a foreshadowing, the world will be made whole. Uh, I, I think a longing, that longing is, is, is a, a sense of the absolute absence in our lives that has an absolute answer. Now, a number of people who have encountered your story, even in brief capsule form, have know that you have a, a cancer diagnosis. And Many of them who've heard that fact have tended to assume that you turn to religion as a response to that diagnosis. But if I read you correctly in My Bright Abyss, it happened a very different way. As I recall what you say there, 
you had an experience of falling in love with your wife, who, the woman who became your wife, Danielle, and you found yourself sitting together, moved to pray. So before we talk about what, what the illness that you struggled with means to you, why don't we go back to that fundamental experience? Um, why love should lead to prayer? Why that falling in love experience should have moved you spontaneously, apparently, both of you, to desire this? Uh, yeah, I think it was looking for somebody to think. You know, it was just, it was, I, I think when I talk about those moments in your life uh, when you have faith, um, there are moments when you are, life seems to overbrim. Uh, reality seems more than reality, and yet itself by being more than reality. And everyone I know uh, in those moments wants to express gratitude of some sort. There's a wonderful poet I know, uh, Anna Kamienska, this Polish poet, who, in her journal she talked about this friend she had, Piotak, and, and Piotak would scrawl in the margins of his poems, thank you God, every time he wrote a poem, and he was an avid atheist. And yet still he couldn't even thank you God for his poems. Uh, I think when, when that happened to both of us, we felt so overwhelmed that we wanted something to think. It felt like grace, and we had no language, or we had lost the language uh, with which to address God, and, and praying together became a way of, of, of trying to do that. Um, I think Simone Weil has a wonderful line where she says, he who has not felt the presence of God cannot feel his absence, and, uh, uh, which I have always found to be true. Uh, So it still wasn't, it was still a bit of a shock to you, at least I, or at least a surprise. You had at that point uh, not been a religious believer for some time. You were used to moving in a certain literary cultural milieu where it was be pretty odd to find someone with your credentials and your background. Um, doing anything as gauche as praying. So, how how did that happen? I mean, how did you how how did you find yourself so surprised by this? Um, you mean what did it look like, or uh, or or like the exact form it took? Well, I'm just I'm just curious. Did it, did it was it sort of? I mean, I know that you were raised in the faith. And so, in some sense, it was latent in you. You had the memory of, of this experience growing up in West Texas. But nonetheless, it, it, as I gather, it seemed to come as a surprise. If, if I was you, I would have said, oh my God, what is this happening to me? Like, do I want this to happen? Yeah, well, I wasn't sure that I would have been able to... Um you know, I kept it at, I kept it at an arm's length, um, any notion of Jesus, uh, until I got sick. Uh, I mean, getting sick made me need concrete, I needed, I needed faith to, to, to take concrete form. I needed a church, I needed people, I needed to know why I needed those things. and. Uh, I hope that if that hadn't happened, I would have made my way to an articulation of faith, but it probably would have been very different. Um, I don't see any break in my life the way that it's been written. I've had people write about me as if there's this huge rift, but if I go, I'm publishing a selected poems this year, and I went in compiling that, it seemed to me quite seamless. In the, uh, the things that I was writing about in my first book, I was writing about in my third book. The, uh, the same concerns. Uh, it's simply the, the language had changed somewhat. Uh, but it was longing. It was, a, it was a, an inchoate longing that was constantly trying to give form to it. So if I hear you rightly, and I just definitely do not want to put words in your mouth, you, you put the words <laughs> so beautifully. 
It sounds like there was at least a little bit of a shift when you received a cancer diagnosis. Are, are you saying that maybe what was a little bit more of a theism, um, a kind of general belief in God, caused you to want to move towards something more concrete, more palpable than, was there a, it was a movement of some kind at that point? Oh, that's absolutely true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, it was Christ. I mean, I, I, could, I could talk to you forever about God because, you know, and God is, is the most ubiquitous word in contemporary poetry. You think, you think that uh, poets are all atheists, but the word God is everywhere, let me tell you. When we got together, when we got ready to, to do a religious issue of Poetry Magazine, uh, it was, all we had to do was just do it. I mean, the, the poems were just flooding in because there were so many poems about God. But, but what the word means usually is just a sort of, it's a sort of sign that says, you know, this way to the ineffable. It just means nothing. And, uh, when I felt my life ending, I needed everything to be concrete. Uh, it's, a real, it's a real paradox. You know, I, 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 at my, I'll read you this one poem. At, um, it begins, Love's Last Urgency is Earth. And I wrote this poem. I, got, I had a bone marrow transplant. And I wrote this um, just before I got the final dose of chemo. When you get a bone marrow transplant, the kind that I had, they, they just blast you and get you as close to death as they can. Surprise, it's surprising how few people die right at that moment, but they, they're very good at it. Um, they, uh, and anyway, you get, you get, in my case, you're unconscious for, a, not unconscious, but you couldn't, I couldn't even focus on the television screen. I was so out of it uh, for a period of about three weeks. Anyway, before that happened, I wrote this poem, Lying in Bed. Uh, and I found that nothing I wanted, I think a great mistake that non-believers make is thinking that what believers want is something abstract, that the fulfillment to longing is an abstraction. It's something that goes on forever. It's the word eternity or it's heaven. It's anything that you can't conceive. In my own experience, in the moments of greatest extremity, what I wanted, what I feared most was the loss of the particular world right in front of me. And what I wanted most was to be able to apprehend that world in its absoluteness. That's how I understand Christianity, is that absolute, completely present in the particular. Love's last urgency is earth. And grief is all gravity, and the long fall always back to earliest hours that exist nowhere but in one's brain. From the hard-packed pile of old mown grass, from boredom, from pain, a boy's random slash unlocks a dark ardor of angry bees that link the trees and block his way home. I like to hold him, holding me, mystery, mastering fear, so young, standing unstung under what survives of sky. I learn too late how to live. Child, teach me how to die. When I was a kid, we found this, I grew up in West Texas, we found this in a pile of grass, should have told this before the poem, a pile of grass and my brother and I found that there was a, a black bee nest in it. And we poked it and, and uh, eventually really poked it. And hundreds of black bees just went all over the yard, just everywhere, black bees everywhere. Uh, and I didn't get stung. The, mir the miracle. Yeah. The miracle of West Texas. So. This longing, in some ways, is a longing for, as you were putting it, the kind of completion or fulfillment that we often use the word happiness for, but cancer diagnosis was no fun. And the reality of life is that it's often full of sorrow, not happiness. Um, and of course, 
a lot of people these days take sorrow or sadness to mean uh, kind of an excuse for cynicism, perhaps, or at the extreme, a kind of nihilism, a kind of being half in love with easeful death. Um, does sorrow, can sorrow and happiness somehow be related to each other? Can they, yeah, I would can they a, feed uh, each yeah. other in some sense? Well, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with the, uh, I mean, I'm a postmodernist poet and, and have inherited the notion that light writes white is a famous phrase that if, uh, um, if everything is light in your life, then you're going to have a blank page. Light writes white. You got to have some kind of tension or agony there to produce something. That's the modernist notion of, of the creative artist. Uh, the danger of that is that you can fall in love, you know, a treasured and luxurious gloom of choice, is how William Wordsworth defined it. Without my loneliness, I would be more lonely, says Marianne Moore, so I keep it. Uh, uh, I was certainly familiar with that um, and needed a way out of it. I, don't, I would use the word joy instead of happiness simply because in my experience, it is possible to feel joy in the midst of suffering. It is not really possible to be happy in the midst of extreme suffering. Uh, joy, I think, surpasses all other emotions and survives all other emotions. Uh, happiness seems to me a different, different thing. Now, you mentioned loneliness. There's, it seems to me that so much of kind of modern life reduces us to individuals and I think it was Whitehead who said something like, religion is what we do with our solitude. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you've written in My Bright Abyss, your experience of faith, this longing for the, the completion, the fulfillment that you found through Christ has led you away from the cult of loneliness toward others. How does that, how does that play out in your life? Oh, well, I changed my life. You know, I left a, an editing job. I was editing a magazine, and, and I left uh, to go to Yale Divinity School, become a professor at Yale Divinity School. I have no divinity training. It was a complete change in my life. Um, and it happened, I mean, you wouldn't believe the set of bizarre circumstances that made that, made that possible. Um, and I did it. Uh, but, very much because I wanted to put faith at the center of my life and I wanted to feel a community of believers around me. Uh, I think that's very wrong, that notion that religion is what we do with our solitude. I mean, in one way it's right. I mean, we all, we all sustain our spiritual lives in solitude, but I'm much more struck by Dietrich Bonhoeffer's notion that Christ is always stronger in our brother's heart than in our own, which seems to me piercingly true. That if, for anyone who feels their faith to be an unstable thing, the thing that stabilizes is, is to see it in someone else, to see it credibly enacted in someone else, uh, and to, to feel yourself interact, interacting with that. Um, you know, the old Hopkins poem, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father, to the features of men's faces. So this longing that points in a direction seems to require a kind of courage, this desire to set out, to see. Um, even when, again, the culture may say there's nothing there, it's, it's wish fulfillment, it's escapism to believe that there is something that permeates reality beyond the atoms that are interacting <laughs> in a given space. And I guess some people have spoken of that risk that people take as the risk of faith. How do you, how do you understand that, that risk yourself? And, and how do you deal with the fear that 
that makes you perhaps draw back from the leap? You know, I think it's actually, we speak in these enormous terms, that poem by, uh, that Edgar Masters term, you know, uses these enormous words, destiny and ambition and love and fear. And, and, uh, and so we think of these big actions in our lives that we're going to take to, uh, to, to thwart fear or to act against it. And in my own experience, it's actually been the tiniest little, <laughs> tiniest little ways that you need to act every day. That, that, that those immensities get compacted into what you say at the breakfast table <laughs> or you know, the way you treat your kids or your students. Or, it's actually quite small. And I think that notion of the eternal um, uh, gets crammed down into our daily lives, gets played out in the, in the most minute atomic ways. Uh, so I don't, you know, how does it play out in me? Badly, I'm sure. I mean, I'm a miserable Christian. Uh, I feel like a, uh, my friend Fanny Howe, a Catholic, a, a woman I, whose writings I revere and whose faith I revere, I was once in one of these situations with her and she said, you know, Chris, I can get up in the morning an atheist and, or get up in the morning a believer and go to bed an atheist. It happens to me every day. And, you know, in, in one way I thought, well, that's, that, that's very depressing because if you, <laughs> who seem to me amazing, are going through that, well, then what hope is there for me? But on the other hand, if she's going through it, well, then there's hope for all of us. Uh, so I, I think Fanny says that for her, you know, the form this takes, what form does faith take? To risk thinking that we are safe. That's very beautiful, I think. To risk thinking that we are safe. I mean, if you're inclined to anxiety, to being overcome by anxiety, to, be, to being overcome by your own fears, to risk thinking that we are safe. Think about it, and it, it actually is... It's a risk. It's, it feels weird to think it's all safe. So that sense of um, that sense in which faith is sort of both a kind of certainty and yet also still a journey, still a kind of being on the way. How is that? Is that a reasonable definition? I mean, because we encounter in the world people who are absolutely certain in, a, in an unhealthy way um, and see doubt as the absolute, you know, antithesis of what their sense of faith is. But you've spoken of faith as, I, I, again, maybe this is my word, but a journey, a kind of a, a having, but a being on the way toward at the same time. Yeah, I don't feel any sense of certainty at all. And I, as I say in, in my book, uh, I, I don't think I really ever experienced the absence of God until I had lost his presence. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel it as an agony until I turned to God. Um, there's a, I was reading recently Tomasz Halik, this, the Czech priest, a uh, very interesting writer. If you haven't read him, he was an underground uh, Catholic priest in, in then Czechoslovakia for years and um, he talks about the parable of the mustard seed and you know the parable of mustard seed is Jesus says if, if you have faith that's the size of a mustard seed then you can move mountains and the way that preachers over the years have used that is well if you have this small faith it can it, just a small faith in something it can grow into a large faith and you'll be able to do great things with it, but Halik says, no, that's exactly wrong. The way to interpret that is, is the mustard seed is this tiny thing. You need to think of it as something that's actually been crushed, and it's almost nothing, crushed down to this vital, volatile speck, and, and that's something that can grow. And he says, that's what Christianity is in the world today. It's been crushed down to this thing in, in his consciousness, uh, uh, and it's crushed down to its essence. Uh, faith can be crushed down to its essence, then it, become, it can become something vital and durable, 
lasting. Um, I was told that he gives these, he gives these um, uh, masses in Prague now, and they are atten- they are atten- they're packed by, with young people, and they are attended by uh, half of them are unbelievers. Uh, he, he feels that he is called to preach to unbelievers. I often feel that, that the things that I am writing are, are addressed at people who are outside of the faith, but looking in. So I, I feel sympathetic to that. Now, before we run out of time altogether, I'm, I'm a little hungry for some more poetry. Do you have a couple of dog-eared pages where you could maybe favor us sure. with a couple more? This is a poem that um, I, some, I, I, Keats, John Keats, the great poet, you quoted him earlier, uh, um, has a letter, 1815 or something. He, he says that he thinks that there are, he posits different existences of different things, and, and he says there are some things that exist only when we turn our attention to them. They require our attention in order to exist. Uh, it has been my experience that faith is like that. Um, I think that I don't have it. I think that God is not real. I turn my attention to it, and I get a response. When the time's toxins have seeped into every cell, and like a salted plot from which all rain, all green are gone, I and life are leached of meaning. Somehow a seed of belief sprouts the instant I acknowledge it. Little weedy, hardy, would-be greenness tugged upward by light, while deep within roots like talons are taking hold again of this our only earth. You want another one? Yes, please. Um, here's one. My, I mentioned my wife. The, I always, I grew up in West Texas. Parts of West Texas are fantastic, beautiful. Not where I grew up. Uh, where I grew up is completely flat and, and barren. It's called Snyder. And, but uh, I wanted to show my wife something there, these tools that my grandfather had that had been in the family forever and were porous from weather and he had hung them on this wall and one of them was called a raking tooth and this raking tooth is in this poem. Here visible distance is so much a part of things, things acquire a kind of space. I reach right through the raking tooth that for so long I've longed to show you. I touch eternity in your face. More? Please. (laughs) (laughs) All right, here. Um, The poem, I, I went three years without writing poems, and this was before I met my wife and before I got the diagnosis, and all those things conspired to uh, um, make me write again. And the first poem I wrote, this is a real story, the, uh, we went to a little church at the, edge of our, at the, at the end of our street, um, and for no other reason than that it was the end of our street. I didn't know anything about denominations or anything. It was, it was a little Protestant UCC church. And, and uh, it turned out to be quite a place. And that afternoon I wrote this poem after not having written in three years. And it's called Every Riven Thing. It's the one from, that this book gets its title from. And it repeats a line, God goes belonging to every riven thing he's made and then it changes the punctuation so that the meaning changes. You'll see. Riven just means torn open, broken. God goes, belonging to every riven thing he's made, sing his being simply by being the thing it is. 
stone and tree and sky, man who sees and sings and wonders why God goes. Belonging to every riven thing he's made means a storm of peace. Think of the atoms inside the stone. Think of the man who sits alone trying to will himself into a stillness where God goes belonging. To every riven thing he's made, there is given one shade shaped exactly to the thing itself. Under the tree, a darker tree. Under the man, the only man to see, God goes belonging to every riven thing. He's made the things that bring him near, made the mind that makes him go, a part of what man knows, a part from what man knows. God goes belonging to every riven thing he's made. Wonderful, Chris. Well, I think we're just getting warmed up, but we gotta stop. Uh, the program goes on. Um, we're so grateful to you for being here. And um, I know a number of people are going to want to uh, get books signed after the event. And uh, we'll look forward to that moment. And uh, now we have a little bit more to go still on this part of the program. But thank you, Chris, very much. Thank you.